Great greetings to all of you. Happy to have you joining us and those who are watching us on our webcast. Welcome. And our new location here as we learn how to set it up. And uh, we're in an interim location right now, meeting until we find ourselves a hall. So hope you enjoy the beautiful backdrop. I, uh, I do. <laughs> so let's just enjoy it and make the best we can with it. <clears throat> I know a lot of people right now that are challenged in various ways. <clears throat> Certainly, I have been. You know, we're keeping our prayers strong for our, our brother, Mr. Whitlake. In a helicopter crash, our prayers are for him. And other people have struggles and trials. And, you know, from time to time, it's kind of good to remember to kind of come back to the basics and to keep these things in mind. We cannot always understand every trial. We cannot always understand everything that's going on in the world. It's just not realistic to think that we're going to be able to understand the mind of God with our mind, and be able to explain everything. Why does he allow that? Why did he not prevent that? He could have prevented it, etc. And you could go on with the endless questions. But you know... <clears throat> There's something else that maybe is a better approach to think about uh, if you're going to question things and wonder, and we all do. If you get bit, if you're bitten by a serpent, a venomous snake, then you need an antivenom. And if you don't get an antivenom, the infection and the toxins will spread throughout your body and your entire life is endangered. And toxins, you know, there can be different kinds of toxins. Some toxins, I know, again, you think about a serpent being bit by a serpent. Some serpents have a very fast-acting toxin, very fast-acting poison. And it works, some work by reducing the breath of air, the breath of life. Uh, some of them, well, they all operate in different ways. Some of them operate very, very slowly. And so the person just shakes it off and goes about their business and doesn't even realize. But over time, they get sicker and sicker. The various ways that we can get toxic, be poisoned, the answer is you need an antivenom. If you get the antivenom, you're going to be okay. If you don't get the antivenom, the toxins increase and your life is endangered. The bite I'm referring to is referred to, uh, referenced back in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Genesis 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the eternal God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every green of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, Shh! And this is where she, uh, he got the bite in. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And lied. So, the lie continues. You know, a lie just by itself sometimes doesn't have the effectiveness, but you give it an explanation that, oh, you know what? That explanation kind of makes sense a little bit. And the lie is made far more dangerous. God knows, Satan said, that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he misrepresents the truth by telling the truth with a twist, telling the truth in a, with a slanted version of it. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, yeah, it looks like, yeah, it looks, makes reasonable sense to me. Pleasant to the eyes, desirable tree, passionate to make one wise, 
Oh, to awaken desire. She took of the fruit and she ate. And she gave to her husband with her. And he ate. The bite. The toxins were set. The antidote. The antivenom for this bite is faith. Trusting God. Which leads to life. And that is the story right there of mankind. Satan has bitten all of humanity with the lie. And faith is the antivenom. Without it, the toxin only grows worse and worse and worse. God knew we were going to suffer trial. He knew that we would have fear leading to more trial and more fear. And the antidote is faith. It is belief. It's faith in God or believing what God says, not just that God exists, but believing in his character, believing in his nature, believing in his plan and his promise, his word, believing and trusting his word for me and for you, believing in his character, trusting him to care for you, to keep you safe, both soul and body. That is the faith I'm referring to. In Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, We see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he might, by the grace of God, taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. So, in other words, (laughs) if we're going to suffer, God said, well, then Yeshua should suffer. We're in this together. And that's the way God looks at it. It's kind of an interesting thing that he wants us to experience what Yeshua did. He wanted Yeshua to experience what we do. We're in this together. We are all brethren. And that's actually kind of a a pretty beautiful thing to realize. And so Yeshua was made lower than the angels so that he could suffer death. He was crowned with glory and honor. And we too will be crowned with glory and honor. He tasted death. We will taste death. He was raised. We will be raised. And if he was made perfect, if he was made better through suffering, so too will we. In so much, verse 14, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself also, or he himself likewise, shared in the same, so that through death he would destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to its bondage. For indeed he doesn't give aid to angels, but he does give this kind of aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made Like his brethren, in all things, Yeshua was made to be like us. So that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That is a pretty profound piece of literature right there to consider indeed. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it talks about Satan taking the whole world captive. The whole world held captive against their will. Certainly, nobody would say, yeah, it's my will. I'd like to be held captive by the devil. But God has promised to free all the captives. He's promised to free us all. That means you. It means me. 
It also means those who do not yet understand that they're even being held captive. Let's review a few reasons why we suffer the way we do. It says Yeshua was made more perfect by his sufferings. He was made flesh so that he could live the things that we live, experience the things we experience, and through it conquer death and conquer fear. Let's look at just a few of the reasons. There are many. Let's look at the few of the reasons we have trials. Trials are kind of on everybody's mind right now. It seems like an appropriate topic. One of the reasons we have trials is to magnify the works of God. By magnifying God's work, that leads to more faith. Let's go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, now, as Yeshua passed, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man? You know, he was so evil, or his sins, and so he got this uh, curse of blindness. You know, like Job's friends, well, it has to be something you did wrong, Job. You won't just suffer trials because you're righteous. And so this is a common thing that people tend to do. And so they were asking Rabbi, you know, asking Yeshua, saying, Rabbi, Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Yeshua answered, and he said, neither. It wasn't because of the sins of this man or his parents, but so that the works of God would be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work, and as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So sometimes we have to suffer these things to glorify God, to show God's power, because God is doing something. He is working something out, and we don't always understand it at the time. You think this man was blind and sat there and contemplated and said, you know, I think the reason I'm blind is because God's going to heal me. And maybe he did. Maybe he did. We often don't understand why we suffer. And if this man was blind because it was for the sake of God's glory, then it wasn't because of his sin. Perhaps he didn't have that great of a life of sin. So you'd think, well, why would this guy be blind? I don't know. We know here because God tells us there are many reasons why things happen. So he spat on the ground, made clay with the saliva, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. That's weird. Why would he do it that way? Why wouldn't he just anoint with oil like normal? I don't know. We can't always know why God does everything the way he does it. And sometimes we have to be willing to accept that. Sometimes we just have to accept that God is God, and we are are not always going to understand as a little child doesn't always understand what its parents are doing. And the parents might explain it, and they might not, and that's their prerogative. Sometimes they don't because the child simply doesn't have the capacity to understand yet, but he will later. Oh, I used to really get irritated with that. You'll understand when you're older. Well, I got older, and now I understand. It's just the way it is sometimes. So, anyway, continuing here in John chapter 9, he created uh, this clay out of saliva and dirt and anointed him and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And then the, uh, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, isn't this the one who sat and begged? Isn't this the beggar? And some said, it is him. And others said, no, it's somebody who looks like him. But he himself said, I am. That is who I am. I'm the beggar. Therefore, they said to him, well, how are your eyes open? And he answered and said, a man called Yeshua made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. I went and I washed and I received my sight. And so they said, well, where is he? He said, I don't know. You see, sometimes it's to magnify the works of God. Instead of glorifying God, some people felt threatened by it. 
there was fear involved. Well, who is this that anointed you? He's not part of our group. And so competition set in. Fear set in. And as soon as fear got involved, the results, well, they feared loss of control. The results were bad. Sometimes things happen simply to magnify God in some way. And we cannot always foresee it. I mean, if you look back, sometimes I look back even at my own personal life. And I see the things that I went through. At the time, it was like just a really a big hassle. Scary, painful. I didn't foresee how it would later help me be a better father. Some of the things I suffered as an employee, and I thought, you know, this is the worst boss. I thought to myself concerning this particular man, you are the worst boss I have ever, 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 ever had. <laughs> you are a horrible boss. And that guy used to stand over my back, literally. I mean, he'd stand right behind me, and he would just stand there and watch me, my boss, for not like 30 seconds, but for like 30 minutes. And that just really gets irritating. And he's, I'm just watching you. So I can see when you make a mistake. I turn, what is it? What is it? And then if I ever asked him, what is it? He'd start pointing out every fault that he could find. Faults that were silly. He was just not a, a good boss. And he did that to a lot of people. And you know what I learned from that? Later on, I had no idea at the time that I was going to employ people. But I learned, I will never, ever treat people like that. I will never treat people like that. And so to this day, I do not like to stand over people's back. I mean, sometimes I do if I'm just looking at a curiosity, but not so I can try to catch them. I just, to me, that is such a repulsive thing. I don't want any part of it. But if I didn't experience that, then what would I have, what kind of a boss would I have been? I learned so many things about how not to treat people from him that I got to thinking about it. I thought, what was a fantastic gift, the opportunity to work for somebody like that. I had another man who told me, he said, now listen, Haney, I'm going to hire you. He says, I just want you to understand one thing right off. He said, you are not paid to think here. I don't need you coming up with an idea, oh, well, let's do this better and let's do that better. He says, we do the thinking in the office. Your job is to do your job. You're not paid to think here. So I see things that were dangerous. I would see things that were harmful to the company. Hey, it's not my business. I was, it was made very abundantly clear to me I was not paid to think. So every time I hired an employee, I, for years and years, I made it a point to tell them, you are paid to think here. I expect you to think. Man, I learned a lot from some of my previous bosses. We can learn through trials, right? You know, it, it, it doesn't do any good if you go through life and everything's all rosy. Then how do you ever learn? How do you learn how to forgive people if somebody doesn't do you wrong? Forgiveness has no meaning unless... There's a need for it. And if we're going to be like him, we need to learn how to forgive. In order to learn how to forgive, we have to learn how to be hurt. We have to learn how to be abused so that we can learn how to forgive. These things are important. There's something that comes out of the depth when you go through these things that helps you to learn and grow. How can you have true compassion on somebody if you've never been sick? It's really hard. Some people just seem to have these lives where they never suffer and they never have a trial. They don't this or that. But I've known, and I've known people like that. It's just like, man, that guy's got a silver spoon. And everywhere he goes, it's a life's easy, his ideal family, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, no struggles financially. No health problems in anybody he knows or she knows. Very, very judgmental people are developed that way sometimes. Sometimes. They look down on others because they've never suffered. 
I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of the way it is sometimes. So what's another reason why we maybe suffer trials? Obviously, for faith's sake, so that we learn to develop faith, so that we would develop godly character and to really learn to trust God. If you don't have want, then what do you need faith for? If you're not sick, you don't need to trust God to take care of you and provide. If, if you don't have a lack or even the threat or the possibility of a lack, if everything is so easy and provided for you, what, do you, what are you trusting God for? What can you learn from your trials that you couldn't learn without them? Ask yourself that, and you might be surprised when you really start to think about it. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior, our God and Savior, Yeshua Messiah, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Yeshua, our Lord, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory or to as I think is better translated, to glory and to virtue, by which we have given, has given to us an exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Divine nature is a high and a lofty goal. Things like that are not obtained easily. So for divine nature... To escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, for the sake of divine nature, which we all want. Bodies that don't get sick anymore. No more fear of death. No more fear of loss. Right? How are we held captive? Through fear of death. Satan has kept us held captive. You know, people are always doing things... I, you know, like one man put it, uh, my friend Mordecai, he says, you know what? Sometimes fear can cause good people to do bad things. And it, it's true. We fear this and we fear that, and so we don't do this or we don't do that that we should have done. would have been better for everybody involved. But, you know, through fear, because of fear, to try to protect ourselves at the expense of somebody else, that's fear. That's not faith. For the sake of divine nature, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, godliness, resolution, virtue, praise, goodness, and add to virtue knowledge, knowledge of Torah, knowledge of God's words, understanding, to knowledge Add self-control. You know, sometimes people say, well, knowledge puffs up. No, that in the context was only talking about, oh, when he said that, he said knowledge puffs up. It wasn't talking about biblical knowledge puffs up. That is so misquoted and twisted and, and is used as an excuse for people not to study the, God's word or to make fun of somebody who studies a lot. And that's just a dumb comment. The Bible's constantly telling people to add to their virtue knowledge, learn and grow, study to show yourself approved unto God. So the only knowledge that was puffed up was the knowledge that you could eat this meat and it wasn't really defiled because somebody said hooga booga over it and a pagan temple somewhere that didn't actually hurt the meat. And that knowledge made you, if you look down on the other people, you know, you guys are so dumb, that's being puffed up. That's the context of what he said. Knowledge is not a bad thing. Knowledge is a gift of God. Add to your virtue knowledge, knowledge of God's word, and to knowledge self-control. Now you know what you need to control. And to self-control add perseverance, and to perseverance add Godliness into godliness add brotherly kindness, learning 
to be kind to one another, learning how to rephrase things so that you don't hurt people's feelings and speaking soft words and loving words and doing good deeds for people. Brotherly kindness. Add to that love. The fulfillment of Torah. If these things are yours and abound, you will not be barren. You will not be unfaithful or, excuse me, fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Yeshua Messiah. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and to make your election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua Messiah. So to develop faith, we suffer so that we can develop patience. We suffer so that we can develop perseverance. So that we can learn how to be kind to people who are not kind to us. That's how you learn to love your enemies. That's how you learn to fulfill Torah. Through the things we go through in this life. Let's look again at Romans, this time Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And beginning in verse 1, it says, Having been justified by faith, we have peace. Peace with God through our Lord Yeshua and Messiah. Having been justified by faith, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. When you suffer setbacks, that's where you learn to persevere. That's where you learn to get up and go forward. Tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance... It produces something as well. Perseverance produces character. Godly character is precious. When you begin to develop godly character, that produces in you hope. The hope of salvation is strong in you now. It all starts with tribulation. <laughs> might not be what we like to hear, but let's at least understand it. At least understand it. Hope does not disappoint because of the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. So sometimes we suffer to develop faith and character. Here's another reason why we sometimes suffer. Sometimes we suffer as a test. Simply as a test. Let's go to James chapter 2. Let's cancel that. Let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Just like the Apostle Paul said, patience, it's translated in some Bibles, it means endurance or perseverance. Patience. But let patience or perseverance have its perfect work. Don't give up. Persevere when you have setbacks so that you may be perfect and complete Lacking nothing. This is simply part of the makeup of our character. God has designed it that way. 
He designed it that way, and he said, Yeshua should suffer the same thing and experience the same thing that you and I do. You and I, he said, should suffer and experience the same thing that Yeshua does. We're in it together. We each have our time in the flesh, a certain period of time that God gives us under the sun. And it's for our good. We go through these things. Psalm 100. Psalm 119. My battery's good. I don't know why it keeps going, cutting out. My battery's good, so I don't know. I have strong battery level. Maybe I'm just sitting in a way that pinched something. I don't know. Okay, Psalm 119, verse 67. Sorry, not Psalm 67, 119, verse 67. I will get there. Be patient with me. Okay, so in Psalm 119, verse 67, David says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. That's something that we could all meditate on. Sometimes, perhaps, we're afflicted because it doesn't mean you're going astray like you're just completely... Maybe there's an aspect of your life that's getting off course. Maybe there's an aspect of your life that is... Maybe everything's on course, but God knows if He doesn't do this or this, you might get off course. You're close to veering off course. You know, sometimes things we do have an effect that doesn't show up until later. You know, how many times, you know, people go to a counselor, right, to get counseling, and it comes back to something that happened in their childhood, their parents this, or their parents that, or something growing up, or the lack of something, or, you know, I didn't get enough milk and cookies when I was a little baby, whatever. And later on, it produces these results. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Afflictions helped David draw near to God. Does that just apply to David? But now I, have, now I keep your word, he says. He says, you are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. Yes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your Torah. And then David says this interesting thing. He says, you know, it's good for me that I have been afflicted so that I can learn your statutes. The Torah of your mouth is better to me than thousands of shekels of gold and silver. If I had all the money, okay, what if you had all the money? Then you could just buy your way out of every trial and every problem. And would you need God then? How important would the statutes be then? You see, the one who can have a lot of money is that when even though it doesn't matter how much money they have, they still love God more. They still love God's statutes. They're still kind to their fellow man. They're still humble, not proud and lofty and arrogant because they're so powerful. Because, you know, you don't get a lot of money without being powerful. The person that is not corrupted by those things is capable of having them. But not everything is intended for today. Some things are intended for tomorrow. But there's something to consider there. Sometimes it takes the depths of a trial 
to reveal the true character of an individual. Sometimes we suffer because it's in that suffering. The things about us are revealed. Sometimes it's in our suffering. The things about others are revealed. You know, God talks to his people and he says, when I punish your enemies, if you begin to rejoice and gloat about it, I'll stop punishing them. You can, <laughs> you can just look it up. I'll stop punishing them and I'll punish you instead. It is so repulsive to look down on people that when somebody needs to be punished, if somebody else is gloating about it, God will stop their punishment. So sometimes we suffer things because it reveals who we are. Sometimes other people suffer things because it reveals things about others. For example, when it says to visit the sick, somebody's got to be sick to test everybody else to see if they are going to visit. It says, when I was sick, you came and visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. Somebody's got to be hungry to see if others will cut loose of some of their precious food and money or resources to give to somebody else. Somebody's got to go hungry to test that. You know how heroes are made? Heroes are made in distress. Nobody becomes a hero. You know, like, God, he could go around. God is capable of doing this. He calls the end from the beginning. God could say, line everybody up. Hero, hero, hero. Not a hero, not a hero, not a hero, hero. And they could have all the heroes and line them up. Okay, all you heroes over here. Well, I never did anything heroic. Why'd you put me over here? Oh, I knew you the well, I knew you would have been a hero. I don't you don't actually have to do anything. You have a hero's heart. You have the character of a hero. You come over here with the heroes, with the people who actually did something. Because, you know, if you were ever faced with it, you would have, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So you come on over here with the heroes. But you other guys, I know you well enough. You would not have been heroic. So you come over here in the non hero place. God could do that. But you know what happens and how somebody becomes a hero? It's under the depth of the trial at the time that they have to dig down deep and put their life at risk to save somebody else or go the extra mile or whatever it was that made them a hero. They had to do it first. They had to demonstrate it first. They had to live it first. They had to risk it first. And it's always in distress. It's not in joy and ease that heroes are made. That's not how it works. Let's go to Genesis and learn from the Father, our Father, the Father of all who believe God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 and verse 12. You remember God told Abram, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. And then in verse 12, he said, wait, do not lay your hand on the lad or do any harm to him. For now I know, God said concerning Abraham, or Abraham, excuse me, it was Abraham by now. He said, now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now I know 
Does it mean that God didn't know right before that? Hey, you know what? Say what you will. The fact is, God wanted to know, and he wanted to test Abraham, the father of the faithful. And then he spoke and he said, now I know. And it was through great duress that he came to understand Abraham. That's how he knew. That's how he knows. There was an opportunity for Abraham to make every excuse and to justify and to say, well, you're actually, you're just speaking metaphorically anyway, right? He could have gone round and round with endless questions and explanations. I just need to know more. God wanted to know Abraham. And based upon my life, I think God wants to know me. I think God wants to know me. And I think God knows a lot about me. A lot more about me than I even know about myself. But there are still a few things that I need to learn. So I continue to suffer from time to time. I get, I'm blessed. You know, it's kind of like, it's just like the rest of you. You know, life is a combination of laughter and sorrow, joy and tears of sorrow. It's a mixture of the two. But God said, now I know. Now a hero is made. Abraham is the father of the faithful. He's genuine. But heroes don't become heroes until they face trying circumstances. Yes, yeah, sometimes life is a test to see what we need. Like any good teacher will test his students so that he knows where they're lacking so that he can help them with it and build them up and make them stronger. Yeah, sometimes it is a test. Remember God said concerning the manna? He said, I'm going to give them manna so that I can test them. And I'll use the manna to find out if they are going to walk in my Torah or not. Not that manna was the completion of Torah. Well, manna was just one little aspect. You know, go out and collect it this certain way. Don't try to keep it overnight. And collect a double portion on the sixth day. Have a preparation day for Shabbat. Don't try to go collecting it on Shabbat. Just from that, I will know if you're interested in walking in my Torah or not. Just from that one thing, God reached that conclusion. And so he tested. How are we doing with our testing? When Job suffered, he complained bitterly about it. And he would not be comforted until finally God spoke. And what was it that God said that actually changed Job's mind? Do you remember? God didn't even address all of the things specifically that Job was complaining. Oh, if God would just come down, roll out the carpeting, I could go before God and talk to him, you know, and all the things he said. And God just finally came down and said, I'm God. Where were you when I did all these things? Do you understand death? Do you have the keys to death and life? Do you know how I made the world? Do you know? Do you understand all my secrets? Do you even know what I'm doing? How many times I remember my children would question me about something. No, what are you doing, Dad? No, don't do this. I'm like, I got it. I got it. They just don't know that I got it. But I knew so much more than they did. And when God spoke, to Job and said, I am the God Almighty. I know what I'm doing. That is actually what comforted him. That's when he stopped complaining. That was when he got a little faith. Sometimes we just need to look to God and trust him. And that's where the true comfort comes from. We won't always understand what's going on or why. 
Let's look at this psalm and consider it. In Psalm 92. Psalm chapter 92. Psalm 92, and I'll just read the whole psalm. I'll begin in verse 1. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Eternal, and it's good to sing praises to your name, O Most High, and to declare your loving kindness in the morning, to declare your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the loop, on the lute, on the harp, with harmonious sound, for you, Eternal have made me glad through your work, and I will triumph in the works of your hands. O oh, Eternal, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know. A fool does not understand. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it's so that they may be destroyed forever. If you think about what he just said there, isn't that exactly the case of what we see in the holiday that we keep called Purim? It wasn't until the enemies raised their hand, marshaled together, assembled, and went out after God's people, then... They were all made known. They made their stand. They took their position. And they began to implement it. Why? So that God could strike them down. Because he doesn't strike down without a cause. But if it's something God wants, he says, you know what? You guys are evil. I've had enough of that. So he will raise them up to do something evil so that he can strike them down. He's the judge. He's the father. And so he struck down the Persians. Fools do not understand that. When the wicked spring up like grass, when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it's so that they would be destroyed. But you, Yahweh, you are on high forevermore. Behold your enemies, O Lord. Behold, your enemies will perish. All the workers of iniquity will be scattered. But my horn you have exalted like that of a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye has seen the des my desire on my enemies, and my ear has heard my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. Then he makes a statement. He says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the eternal will flourish in the courts of our God. And they will bear fruit into, even in their old age. They will be fresh and flourishing in their old age. Just like Moses, when he was 120, it says he still, his strength had not abated. They will be fresh and flourishing even in their old age to declare that the eternal is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So what are we to consider from this psalm if we actually stop? and Just let's stop and think about it. He says how the wicked are like grass springing up. But the righteous, they're like a palm. They are like, they are like a palm tree, verse 12, growing like a cedar in Lebanon. Now, you know, let's just think about that. If you were to take the seed of grass. So you took some grass seed and maybe you took a palm seed or maybe a, a, from a, a cedar and you plant them together on the same day, water them and begin to watch. That grass will spring up very quickly. <sighs> wow, man, this grass is really growing. Is that palm sprouted yet? Oh, it'll probably come up later. Oh, the grass is getting pretty big. Oh, there it is. I think, I think that's the palm. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see as it develops a little more. But I think that's a palm. Cool. Oh, wow, the grass is getting pretty long here. We better get the lawnmower out and mow it. 
or let's just let it keep growing and turn into its, maybe let's let it grow and flower. You know, to the untrained, to the untrained eye, you could look, if you planted the grass and you planted the palm on the same day and you watched them grow together, you could very quickly reach the conclusion, you know what, this grass is going to overtake that palm and snuff it out. The grass is way stronger. The grass blooms. The grass, and that's like the wicked. Seems like they multiply. It seems like wickedness just can grow and flourish but people are trying to do right are struggling. And it's just like the grass in that palm. And the problem is, God has given us promises, and it's our impatience. You see, what the devil offered Eve was the same thing that God offered Eve. Life, knowledge, to be like God, to know good, to do right, to live, to eat of the beautiful fruits. Satan was trying to shortcut the method, get it right now by eating of this tree, disobey God, get it and take it fast, like grass, spring up real fast. God's way is no, if you watch over time. That grass will grow up, it might get this tall, and then it's going to wither and die. By the time the grass grows and withers and dies, what's the palm? Six inches, maybe? A new batch of grass comes up the next year, the palm still grows. The same palm. Year after year, the grass comes and goes, and the palm gets bigger and taller and straighter. And upright. Sometimes we are too impatient to see the promises of God being fulfilled in our lives. And we suffer trials and all we see is the what's going on right now. How come that grass looks so green and abundant over there and I'm this scrubby little palm over here? And sometimes we need to be patient. Give it time. Give God time to fulfill his promises because his promises are sure. They will not fail. Remember, Abraham was promised a city. He was promised a country. He was promised his own land and that his children would become as the sand of the seashore. The father of the faithful waited. His son was 40 years old. without a wife. Finally, he, he got a wife. Her name was Rebecca. Abraham got to see his grandson. Not a whole multitude like the sand of the sea, but he saw a grandson. He saw the promise. He didn't get to see the city. He looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. He knew where Jerusalem was going to be. That's the location where he offered Isaac. It's the location of the temple in Jerusalem. He was a man of faith who understood that not every promise of God is intended to be fulfilled right now in the flesh. But he trusted God. And the Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, if all we have is hope for what we get in the flesh in this life now, then we of all people are the most pitiable. Sometimes we spend too much time looking at the grass. We need to be thinking about God's promises of the palm tree. The righteous will flourish like a palm that keeps growing and growing and growing. And we suffer, and through that suffering we grow. And Abraham suffered, but he did not waver in his faith. God's promises are sure. I hope that Psalm 92 can really 
mean something to you. It should mean something to all of us. In Psalm 11, just going back a little bit, Psalm 11, excuse me, I think it's Psalm 1 actually, and that's where I want to go. All the way back to Psalm 1, Psalm 1 and verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the path of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Torah of God. And in the Torah he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He will be like a tree. Trees grow slowly over time, but they do grow and they become strong and stately. He will be like a tree planted by the waters. I got all these, I have this creek running by here. Oh, look at how big those monster alder trees are out there. Look at the size of those maples and the cedars along that creek where their water is sure. Planted by rivers of water. Brings forth fruit in its season whose leaf will not wither. And whatever he does, it will prosper. The ungodly are not like that. They're like chaff, which is wind-driven. Therefore, the ungodly will not stand. When? They're standing right now. What do you mean they won't stand? Well, it says that they will not stand in the judgment. See, not every promise is for today in the flesh. But at the time of the judgment, like it says in Malachi, then you will again discern between the righteous and the unrighteous, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. Then you will discern. Because in the judgment, the ungodly will not stand and sinners will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. Yep, that's the key. It's at the time of judgment. The Apostle Paul said, the ways of God are, the mysteries of God are just too immense, too deep, too past. They're past finding out. My mind is not capable of understanding everything God is doing. And neither is yours. And so when we look and we see a beloved brother suffering or this trial or that trial, and we sometimes, you know, we look at our lives and we can get discouraged or we can think why does God allow this that's like asking you know why do we only have one moon I don't know God made it that way that isn't even the right question to ask why did God allow this why did he allow that those questions are kind of silly a better question would be, what is God's character? What is God going to do? What has he said he's going to do? And do I believe him? Do I believe him? That's what got Job through. That's what got Abraham through. When Yeshua was praying and sweating drops of blood, that belief is what got him through. And that's what is going to, that is the only thing that is going to actually truly make sense to me or you. When a palm and the grass are planted at the same time, it looks like the grass is winning. Be patient and believe because we are in this together. We are in the same world and in the same flesh made in the same image of the same God as Yeshua, our beloved Savior and King. We have every reason to hope. You know what? Let me do one thing. Let's close here. Let me read one more passage. Let's close in 1 Peter. 
close in 1 Peter chapter 5. It's going to close there, but I think, I think we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Peter says to be vigilant, to be sober, because our adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You know, it's not just people in of faith who walk with God who suffer. It's not just the Jews who suffer. It's not just people in the church who suffer. All men suffer. But may the God of all grace, verse 10, who called us into his eternal glory by Messiah Yeshua, after you have suffered for a while, may he, may he perfect you establish you, strengthen and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.